So welcome everybody. Good evening, morning or afternoon, wherever you are. I'm Richard Richter. I'm working as a developer with Evolvome. I'm a developing a midpoint. And um, today we will talk about native PostgreSQL repository, which is our new repository implementation in version 4.4. So what will we talk about? We'll first talk about what mid Midpoint repository is. Then we'll talk about why we needed new repository. How does it work? And afterwards we will go to more practical topics like how to use it, tune it, and how related audit works because SQL audit is always related to the implementation of the repository. So what is Midpoint Repository? In short terms, it's uh, just a storage for Midpoint objects. It keeps the object persistent while, for instance, um, you shut it down and then uh, start it up again. So that's the most important thing. But even if um, somehow magically Midpoint could um, keep these objects active, uh, it's not efficient to keep them in memory all the time. So there's also the fact that you want to store objects that you don't use very often somewhere else out of memory and then just get them when you need them. It must support those basic create, read, update, delete operations. That's pretty obvious. And uh, Midpoint uses uh, SQL database as a repository, although technically it can be something else. But there are reasons why we uh, got to SQL databases and why we, st we stick to them. So the minimal repository is um, one where you insert object. You know, you have this XML that represents the object. You load it in, or for instance, import and uh, it uses the provided OID or generates one if you don't and stores this this blob somehow under full object it's not you know the line here seems to be direct but it's not that direct it's actually passed and then formatted again and then you can load this object via OID and you will get again its representation or midpoint uses it to work with it uh, so it does, of course, we don't work with the textual representation, we work with object structure. But this is just a representation, it's not necessarily what is stored here. So then we will add update and delete operations and we're done, right? No, we're not, because obviously everybody wants to search for objects and it's not possible only by OID. So we want to search by name or by many other complicated conditions. So the repository must be reasonably efficient for search. There are many internal hard-coded searches and then there are many other searches uh, our customers need to construct how they want. And for this reason, uh, we have something called Midpoint Query API, which is uh, like a query language where... Uh, and this query language is actually used for all searches in, uh, in Midpoint. There are no hard-coded searches. Even the hard-coded searches are actually uh, coded using this query API. If you need to search many, many objects, there is a mechanism called iterative search. We will mention it here and there, but of course we can't go into many details. In some cases, uh, we don't necessarily want to search for objects, but we search for containers directly instead. Uh, you know, this is like uh, various cases and stuff around certifications. Uh, those are uh, cases where we, where we search for containers. If we want to search for objects or containers inside our repository, obviously we can't use full object for it, because otherwise we would have to go linearly through all those objects, always uh, pass that full object, look inside whether it's it contains what we need whether the object matches and 
that would not be efficient. So we need to somehow extract those properties for, from full object. So this is not a typical database for common information system where the columns are actually used for storing the data. In midpoint, uh, the columns are used only for uh, to, to enable searches. Because otherwise, it really is that simple storage which stores uh, some blob, so to say, under an OID. It's a document storage in the first place. But we have to enable those searches. And there's also other complication because we don't know what properties we have in midpoint. We know what properties we designed, but we don't know how you will extend midpoint objects. So there's the extension schema, and we have to be able to um, explode those properties into the database somehow as well. So you can search by extension uh, properties. So in most cases, there's a little footnote here. For most case, in most cases, the columns store uh, just the data that are in the full object as well. There are minor exceptions, like for instance, uh, a photo or some index-only attributes, but we will not talk about these uh, extensively here. So instead of this very simple database where you will simply uh, store the full object blob under an OID, we got to this. Uh, this is actually a schema from uh, the old repository, but from this perspective, the new one looks pretty much similar. What is that full object we are talking about anyway? Uh, repository stores serialized form of the object. It's not necessarily what you provide uh, for uh, in, in the input, uh, what is it, text area, or um, what you upload via uh, Midpoint Studio. Uh, one of those typical Midpoint serializations, so either XML or JSON, is actually used, but this is just a technical detail. Otherwise, the full object serialization is implementation detail. And, um, but we know that uh, sometimes our customers uh, like to look inside. So it is something readable in the end. When inserting that XML object into midpoint, uh, you know, on the, like when, you do, when you do an import, that XML, import is for, that XML document is first deserialized then processed and then reserialized again in the repository. So it's not uh, your document in directly into the database. Uh, it's pretty obvious when you open that object again in the GUI, you open that XML, it's much richer, much, there are many other uh, metadata stuff that uh, Midpoint adds on its own. So the object is modified during the import in uh, so-called model level, uh, but it's also modified by the repository itself. Uh, a repository has some responsibilities. It generates container IDs, OID is generated if it's missing, and it also bumps the version number. How the objects are exploded and what are the relations between them and the repository? Well, each object is a separate aggregate. That's a nice aspect of midpoint design. So user, you know, when you see that XML representation, it's actually what is stored in the M user and related tables. For some multi-value containers, we of course need some subtables and, and so on, but all these things, they hold together. There are foreign keys between them and so on. But between the objects, or when you have some reference, uh, that OID that points to some other object, that's, an, that's not a uh, foreign key. These uh, these uh, links are just soft links. And uh, the integrity of the whole system that's uh, like between object integra uh, in, um, integrity is not a responsibility of the repository. It's the responsibility of layers above, like model. When we look back how the repository evolved, uh, mind you, this is a very old picture. Um, like 10 years ago, is it? We had an XML database repository and uh, 
but very quickly we decided to switch to SQL, which is the repository you know. It's the repository based on Hibernate. Of course, it evolved a lot, but it's a repository that started in 2012. And now we're now we create a new repository. We'll talk about it. And again, we we decided for SQL database. This uh, picture shows that. Uh, Every repository, when it's implemented, it has to conform to an API. We'll talk about it in a minute. And one of the plans were to implement repository on top of uh, LDAP. But uh, now we know much more about Midpoint, how it's used. Uh, for instance, it's much more modifier heavy, and that definitely doesn't suit LDAP products. Uh, so now we know that this was really just science fiction. So we're still in this domain of SQL repositories, but the implementation changed a bit. We've seen that that circle here, you know, this interface or API, uh, that's something that clearly separates a repository from other parts of Midpoint. Because nothing in Midpoint depends on repository implementation. Everything in Midpoint depends only on repository API, on the contract. So uh, I'll not go into much details, but if there are some programmer, programmers working with Hibernate, you know, how entities travel all the way, sometimes even to uh, GUI, that's not how Midpoint works. Repository implementation, uh, on, the other, uh, on the other hand, it depends on some low-level parts of Midpoint, like uh, it knows how to work with schema, it uses Prism library, and so on, Prism structures. Uh, but uh, otherwise, it also doesn't know much about uh, about uh, midpoint. Like model model is way above it, so it all talks through that repository API, and this clear separation, this clear boundary, makes the re-implementation of a repository somewhat easier, so to say, because <laughs> saying that it's easy would be an understatement. We mentioned repository, we mentioned model too. So, as I said, model is much higher level API. Model is what uh, you know encompasses the internal logic of of Midpoint. There are also other modules we want to talk about like provisioning and so on. But model works all, with all these, uh, and in the end, it calls repository API when it needs to store something or get something. Uh, many uh, operations on the model looks very uh, look, look very similar to uh, repository API, but they are much more complicated. You know, getting object on the repository level is much simpler task. We simply just somehow put it together uh, from that serialized form and then give it to model and model does many other things with it. So repository is much simpler than model, uh, like uh, logic wise, but it's not dumb either. You know, it uh, as I said, it fills missing information like uh, OIDs uh, or container IDs. It also understands uh, that query API, so it uh, has to know how to interpret searches, how to translate them to uh, actual database queries. It uh, has to know how to update objects in the repository using Prism deltas. So you know, the object is not replaced as a whole. That uh, uh, our ideal, uh, what is it? The relativity model actually goes all the way down to repository, at least on the API level. You know. So let's talk. What is why we why we needed that new repository? Why did we decide to implement it? Obviously, if there were no problems with the old repository, we wouldn't. So. One of the problems is that um, while in 2012 we really needed to support more databases, uh, Midpoint were in no position to simply say, you know, we will only give you this. Uh, the situation changed um, also in that um, customers are more willing to uh, use other databases. You know, it's not like we use only this and nothing else. Uh, so it's it's so. After all these years, we decided to uh, cut down the number of supported databases. Uh, recently, we dropped uh, MySQL and MariaDB, 
and we still support with the old repository Postgre, Oracle and SQL Server. Um, it is less than before, but it's still too much to, to use the strengths of any of them. And the code is still littered with many annoying ifs that take care of uh, the variability between these databases. We used Hibernate library, which is a very popular object relational mapping product. And um, while this helped a lot with the supporting of all these databases, it also has some complications. Now, if you're interested in them, there's a great article called uh, Vietnam of Computer Science, which is quite long, but it's a great uh, talk about how sometimes very nice products or like the promises made by ORM, o -O -R -M are uh, much shinier than the reality of NIS. So the generic support of multiple databases, as I said, can't use strength of any of them. And also the generated SQL is not always ideal, uh, which uh, is caused by the SQL table design. You know, it doesn't mean that it was necessarily bad, it, but it worked then and now we feel that it doesn't work so well anymore. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, also, now we know that mo midpoint in many cases is much more modify heavy. So objects are modified much more often. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, it's uh, also a design problem. Let's face it, you know, like REST, for instance, always logs in and logs out user. So there are uh, ways how to improve this. But even then, uh, many tasks, uh, we, when we don't talk about REST, many tasks still um, for many many modifications and we have to face it you know so the database have to be able to handle it mm, the old database had all the full objects you know the column was on a single table for all the objects and sometimes this table was mm, quite heavily contended uh, so like locking uh, I said that the generated queries were sometimes inefficient uh, Examples like uh, validity scanner or correlation queries uh, um, can be well known for uh, some. Uh, the query interpreter uh, generated actually that hibernate query language, not SQL. So there is like one more translation. And uh, while the HQL sometimes look logical, the final SQL often looked much worse, especially when we counted the joins. Also, we had some troubles with exists filter, which was implemented as join and not real exists. So uh, generic repository actually does not support not exists consistently. It's not supported at all. It somehow works, but not the right way. And because of those joins, if you matched, uh, if multiple uh, items on a single object matched the condition, you would get those results that many times and you had to use distinct option to do so due to like clear it up i mean so the new uh new repository is something between revolution and evolution it's still an sql database but now we support only postgresql uh, postgresql seems to be a nice fit because midpoint is open source so <laughs> it would be probably strange if we supported only Oracle, for instance. Uh, and it's also uh, most advanced open source database. Um, anyone who looks uh, through the release notes uh, of PostgreSQL for the last decade um, must feel similar. So they advanced a lot. Hibernate as a library is gone and it's replaced by a comparatively simpler query D DSL library, which uh, is used to generate uh, SQL queries. <clears throat> Table structure, it uses now uh, inheritance, PostgreSQL inheritance. We'll uh, explain how it works in a minute. And we can also utilize with a single database, you know, we can focus on the types it, it uh, offers us and um, take advantage of them. And I guess it's a nice segue to how it works inside a little bit. It will, I hope it will be light enough. <clears throat> so, 
So the table structure comparison. Uh, at the first look, look, it looks very similar. You know, on the left side is old repository. Uh, there are how object type hierarchy uh, for user looks like. It's simplified, but user is inherited from type called focus and it's inherited from type object. And tables look very similar. But um, the thing is that common columns for object are here, common columns for focus uh, data is here, and finally user specific columns are here. And when you want to uh, do a query, query that uh, uses any of these columns, you actually have to join all of these tables to be able to ask um, for user by not only user specific columns, but also by, and I don't know, name, for instance, although okay, name was a bad example because <laughs> that's copied here as well, but something else, you know, from focus. Uh, new repository, it looks very similar, but the difference is that um, these tables here, they actually just kind of declare type. Uh, so an object table only says, you know, I have these columns, but there are no data in this table. It's uh, kind of abstract. And the same goes for mFocus. It says, I will inherit all the columns from object and then add some, but I don't carry any data. And then finally, a user table uh, adds more columns, user specific columns, but also all the rows of for user, uh, for user objects are stored here. So when you want to query uh, for a user, you only query for this table. You know, the, the simple cases, you know, not like going to uh, assignments or so. So how does it look? Uh, here is a realistic query uh, where we ask, it, it's not stated here, but uh, it's a query for users. Uh, which uh, uh, match the condition that uh, on the user exists some assignment that has you know valid from two dates between something. How does it look uh, when the query is generated? Um, this is taken from Oracle, so it's not absolutely perfect comparison, but it looks very similar if it was from Postgres. Sorry about it. Um, so the select looks very similar, you know, but our better control over queries always sh already shows here because, you know, these things are not generated. We decided it will be you. Uh, so it's, I guess, readable. Um, then we go to a user table. That's the same thing, but we don't join these tables in the new repository. And then is this exists affair uh, where we use this uh, left outer join to simulate exists and uh, which may or may not cause problems. It will always give you what you want, but sometimes in multiple rows, you know. Uh, finally, there is older, oh, sorry, older, order where we have to treat OID um, specifically because it's a varchar type. Oh, we will get to this difference in a minute as well. Here, uh, exists is really exists. Conditions are the same. And order by OID is very simple because OID is UUID type on the Postgres. <clears throat> Before we go a bit deeper into the structure of databases, all the tables are stored in a couple of files. So we probably are familiar with uh, the structure of uh, these uh, SQL scripts from the old database uh, where you have uh, all script for initialization and then you have upgrade script uh, or for LTS you have two different update upgrade scripts but there is an initialization and upgrade script and there are flavors for various databases. The new repository has only a single database but it has three separate initialization scripts uh, which uh, may be a little bit annoying, but it's not a problem to run all of them at once. But it allows you to initialize, for instance, separate audit easier. While previously you had to you know, extract, copy, paste from a bigger script. Here it's pretty clear what is what. And then there are two upgrade scripts. Uh, one is for main portion of the repository and one is for audit. This third part, it's uh, for scheduler tables, uh, which are based, uh, our scheduler is based on a quads library. So these are tables uh, prescribed by the library. 
Separate upgrade scripts are important, again, if you have a uh, main portion of the repository and audit in separate databases. Uh, I also want to point out that uh, these scripts uh, are quite heavily commented, often with links to Postgres documentation, uh, so they may be interesting reading by itself. So, as uh, I uh, said on a previous slide, we have separate main portion of the repository, audit tables and scheduler. By default, Midpoint connects to a single database and expects that everything is there. Uh, this uh, doesn't require so many connections in total, so there's a better control over number of connections, uh, which is a very important aspect when you have multi-node setup. You really should know what is the total maximum number of all the connections all the midpoints uh, can create because you should never go over the limit of uh, maximum number of Postgres connections. Uh, we'll get to it. But each part can be separated in its own database. Uh, we generally don't recommend to separate scheduler tables. It doesn't make much sense. And it also, if you do so, uh, it automatically takes 10 more connections. It's not very economical. Um, so keep this and main portion of the repository together, but audit, that's, that's an interesting idea to separate that one. And we will talk about audit. How can these connection look? You know, there's a very small deployment with limited number of connections. And uh, we see that there is only one name used, MP repo, which is the main portion of the repository, possibly including audit which is this case. If you have, uh, so, so nice thing is that we actually now set this application name for the connection. So the administrator can clearly see what is, uh, you know, it can separate, for instance, some administra administrator connected to the database from the application connected to the database. So it's very easy to monitor a number of connections. This is an example with a separate audit uh, connection pool. So the application created two separate connection pools. Uh, it's uh, questionable whether you want to have separate audit in the same database or not, but it's possible. Uh, it's perhaps even better to have it on a separate server because of the um, like uh, performance profile you know, is different. So the main differences between the old and new one, new repository. New works only with Postgres, but it utilizes more of its features. It scales better. You know, we have some tests to prove it, and uh, we hope it will do so in <laughs> nearly all cases. It produces more efficient queries. Uh, of course, it, there is, it, it's still an SQL database, so you can hit some limits, you can hit some bad plan chosen by Postgres. Uh, so, you know, like no one can promise you on uh, quite a generic system that all queries will run under i don't know few seconds you know it's simply not possible but there are ways how to tune it it uses um, the structure table structure uses postgres inheritance for tables uh, we'll talk about it uh, in the next slide and many interpret uh, filter interpretations uh, well improved especially around exists but also eq filter between multi-value properties and multi-value like multiple values on the on the right side uh, more cases are now supported not all cases but more cases are supported um, finally because the exist was re-implemented as the real exists it does not require distinct nearly at all so i think that's a big like win on for this new repository. Uh, iterative search is very important, is used by task and uh, it, uh, it is a mechanism that can go over many, many objects iteratively by, by means of smaller pages. And previously, uh, user could choose iteration method for some specific cases, uh, but this was um, a result of uh, some like history uh, when we introduced more and more 
uh, iterative methods which were better and better. In new repository, we decided that we will only use one and there is no way how to choose it. So the one should be the best one and it should work for all the cases. It is reasonably good already. It should be as good as, as the best method on, in the old repository and it will be improved. Mm, schema schema differences. Oh, I mentioned it a couple of times. <laughs> it uses inheritance for object and also container tables. So uh, similar hierarchy like for objects is also for containers. Uh, this means that you can also query the M object table and it will uh, give you all the objects in the database. Now it's not necessarily a good idea on <laughs> big deployment, but uh, you can do so. It works internally as a union of all the queries on all the sub tables and similarly for containers. Uh, but this inheritance is more used for, you know, to, to declare common columns on this more abstract tables. It's so we don't have to repeat it over and over again in the schema file. Uh, it's not necessarily to allow a select of containers. For objects, it, it is important because you can query objects, of course. Concrete object table, like mUser, now contains all the columns physically and all the data related to M users. So there is nothing in other object tables. There are some other related containers and ref tables, of course, uh, but otherwise everything is on that M user table and related subtables. Nothing is on the on other object tables. So no joins is necess are necessary for uh, for the focus or object table. That's very important, including full object so that blob carrying the full object is also on that M user table or other tables, you know, like M roll, whatever. Different reference types are in separate tables. Uh, previously, all the refs uh, between, you know, sing uh, single refs are directly on, in columns, like in, in the row. But when you had multi-value references, uh, we, have, uh, we had a table for that. And this table had references of all the types. Now the types are split. It's like natural partitioning. Uh, this is especially good for smaller tables because those uh, refs that don't have so many um, like instances, so to say, uh, joins of these tables are much faster. Extensions. That's a tricky point. Uh, they are now stored as a as JSON B in ext columns, similarly attributes for shadows, uh, so they are stored in line with the object. Uh, this uh, there are some pros and cons. Uh, it means that there are fewer tables, but the table that stores these uh, extension columns, which is the like M user table for instance, it can be larger, like the volume can be bigger. But there is uh, this mechanism called toast on uh, Postgres database, which uh, puts everything that is too big, so-called out of line, to another storage. So that makes the volume of the table itself uh, smaller again, which is good for uh, cases when you uh, fall back to uh, sequential scans in, data in the database. Future may bring other storage options for extensions and attributes. We had some ideas, but uh, we couldn't simply implement all this flexibility in the first version of the native repository. Um, there are also some specialties, thanks to Postgres, like uh, some simple multi-value attributes are stored, or properties, sorry, are stored in line as well in arrays or JSONB. Typical example is subtype, which is stored in text array directly on the table. Uh, there are some column type differences. The main, the most important one for our users and customers is, oh no, not users, but you know, customers, is uh, the change of UUID, co OID column, sorry, because now it's UUID type. It's not varchar anymore. It's not a textual type anymore. This is super important. And now, Midpoint never generates non UID objects. But if you import, so, so this relates to configuration objects, because there was nothing preventing you from writing some, you know, semantically meaningful text there. Uh, but now it's not possible. So the UUID format, it actually represents 16 bytes or 128 bits 
uh, label. So it's not a text, it's just number. And it is represented as a hexadecimal ca uh, characters with dashes. You know, the string you see, it's just a representation of this number. So you have to only use uh, characters from 0 through 9 and A to F and nothing else. And the dashes must be at, at those specific places. And then instead of any limited uh, varcars, we use text, uh, which is actually alias to varcar, but um, more important, we don't have any uh, length limit there. I was surprised when I learned that Postgres actually doesn't care about it, you know, that it's fine with it. It respects the length, but there is no reason why to have it there, uh, like performance-wise. Uh, so that's how we decided, and it's very practical for practical for cases when you simply don't know in advance uh, how long the string will be. Then uh, custom enumerations are represented by uh, sorry enumerations like, for instance, this object type here uh, or administrative status are now represented by custom enumeration types in Postgres, which makes the tables much more readable. On the other hand, uh, repeated URIs are stored in a separate table, uh, so that's less readable. But I think it's a good uh, uh, trade-off. Object items versus columns. You know, typically when you have uh, item like property for instance single string it goes into a single column that's natural uh, then you have those typical cases like uh, uh, poly strings when you have two columns for a single poly string or references where which use three columns typically for uh, storing a single reference uh, when you have a single value uh, item on a single value container, like for instance metadata create timestamp, it can also be inlined directly in the same table, for instance amusa. Uh, although this is declared for objects, so it's actually declared here, but it will appear physically in amusa. <clears throat> then there are uh, typical cases which are stored exactly like uh, on, on the old database, uh, multi-value containers, we simply have to create uh, separate rows in separate table, for instance, assignment. Uh, and then there are cases which are stored differently. Uh, I mentioned already that some multi-value properties, the simple ones, can be stored directly in one column in an array or JSONB. Subtab is the example. <clears throat> there are also some forms in this serialized, uh, sorry, there are also some exa um, uh, differences differences in the serialized form. Uh, I mentioned already that the serialized form is technically a mm, implementation detail, but we know how it is. And uh, the main difference is that uh, previously XML was used and often compressed. Now JSON is used. It's uh, not formatted. It, no, it's uh, white spaces are stripped to make it smaller. And this affects uh, various full object columns and also delta columns in audit. No compression is used. There is no option for that anymore in the application for the new repository. The, the old repository, of course, has it still. Uh, and this is left to a uh, database. Easier, um, it is easier to access that content when it's uncompressed. So it's also nice for like reading the data transparently. Postgres actually compresses the data uh, depending on the size threshold. And if the data is also too long, it stores it out of line. Uh, I mentioned already this term uh, in that toast table, which is always related to the main table. So anything too big uh, is stored to another related table. But you don't have to know about it unless you really go deep uh, into Postgres administration. <clears throat> there are some special M object columns uh, like version, uh, which uh, is uh, used for optimistic lock in. Uh, it also appears in the full form uh, of the object in, the, in this XML. Uh, there is, uh, okay, 
extension column is uh, very important. We'll talk about that, uh, especially around indexing. And there are also two completely technical columns, uh, DB created and DB modified, uh, which are uh, set by triggers. And they are not accessible by the application at all. So they are clearly uh, only for like database administrators. So we can see when, when the row was physically touched. And finally, there is this object type column, which is not that important for uh, the concrete table like M user because you know that there are only users there. But when you uh, when you look at the table like M object with mix of types, you can see what that row, uh, what is the type of that row. Example of M user structure, and this is already shortened a bit. So let's just go quickly over it. So it has OID like any other object. It has this object type I mentioned, which is enumeration type. Uh, full object where the serialized form is stored. This is example three columns for a single row, uh, for single ref, for single reference. Uh, this is stored directly in this table, which means that it's a single value reference because multi-value references must be stored in separate table. Uh, other examples, subtypes, as I mentioned, it's a text array, uh, full text info, okay, it's not important, extension, we'll talk about that more extensively. Uh, there is also photo, uh, which uh, now we got into this violet area of uh, M focus columns, these were common columns for all objects, these are focus columns. Uh, photo is interesting because it's actually stored only in this column, it's not in the full form, and when the repository, when you ask repository for the object and also ask uh, that you want the photo as well, it merges it into that object, you know. Um, and then finally, here are some a few examples of M user columns. There are many forms of names and so on. And this is also interesting organizations and organization units, previously separate tables, now they are stored as array in JSON B. Uh, it's, it can't be a simple array because these are actually polystrings, so we have to also store uh, original and normalized uh, forms there. So these are the examples when we use those features of um, Postgres. Few indexes here. Uh, we will talk about gin indexes more. These are used for various complicated structures like uh, JSON and uh, JSONB especially, you know. Uh, but they are also used for cases uh, like this trigram option is used when you really want to uh, have efficient substring search. So that's also interesting. Uh, this is example of custom index. We will talk about it uh, on a separate slide too. Mm, there, are more there are more indexes, of course, but uh, Let's not talk about all of them. So, and there is the information that this table actually inherits from M focus table, you know, which would have, which would have all the columns from here to around here. So that's the structure. How does it look when you query it? Um, this is, uh, I think it's called extended view uh, when you uh, have column and value on on separate rows. Uh, I looked for uh, some random user, really, you know, give me randomly first user um, without any order. Uh, show me OID, object type, origin name, so it's all here. Here is full object, so you can see that it clearly is uh, a JSON, quite um, like uh, compressed is not the right word, stripped of any white spaces, right? Um, because this is in PSQL, uh, which is a built-in client, uh, I had to actually use convert from function, which uh, takes this full object, which is a byte array, and I'm saying that, okay, it's a string con uh, coded with UTF-8, so make a string from it, and then I'm just cutting first 100 or I don't know how many characters. So that's how you make it readable in PSQL. Many other clients will do it automatically for you. Uh, interesting information is this, that uh, the full object size is like 1500 bytes, 
but its length is 3900 bytes. This is actually the length of this string, and this is how much storage it takes, so it obviously is compressed. Uh, and then another example is um, extension. You can see that the extension is stored. This is JSONB column. Uh, so there are keys, which are actually numbers, but because JSON keys must be strings, they are always uh, quoted. So there are numbers, which are IDs of extension items. We will talk about it. And then there are value, uh, values. And values, uh, you know, we have few value types in JSON, like string, what is it? Boolean and num number. So even things like date have to be represented as strings. But nice thing about this format, which is ISO 8601, which is my favorite format for date, uh, it actually is, uh, you can order it by you know, alphabetically, and it is actually the order of those uh, dates. Um, depending on the date, uh, on, on this time zone, but we always <laughs> store it as a Z, so that's important thing, of course. Uh, here's an example of multi-value extension. We will have more examples later. So with these more and more like, practical examples, right, we're getting to the native repository, how to use it and tune it, actually. Now we know, now we've seen some table. Let's, let's use it. <clears throat> Uh, to do so, let's get back from database for a while, because uh, you can use this uh, document, uh, I really recommend, I recommend using this document, uh, which uh, describes how to install the database. Well, not the, the first installation step depends on the operation system, so uh, we don't cover that, but the post-install uh, configuration is mentioned there and how to initialize the database with our scripts and so on and so on how to change a configuration and then you can run midpoint right <clears throat> it's very important uh, to always uh, use a fresh database and always point it to the right database uh, if you if you use like i'm running native uh, repository on the old database that's that can cause serious problems so don't do that um, post the configuration is a uh, ah yeah that's a very important decision I already mentioned a couple of times decide whether you want separate audit because for any non-trivial um, deployment audit is virtually always the biggest portion of the database of the, of the volume of the database and especially if you run it for years it will get larger and larger depending on how often you clear it. So it's good to have it in a separate database. Uh, also, the profile, uh, you know, of the queries is different. It's a good idea. Use uh, example uh, configuration file. You know, you have to rename it to config XML because that's how it has to be named in the end. But you can use this file as a template for config XML if you want uh, to use native repository. And after you use that example, you should definitely consult the configuration uh, reference documentation. As an example, this is the default config XML generated by Midpoint when you started the first time. It will create this section for H2 database and uses it, but it will also create this commented um, example for native repository. So you can start there, and you can remove this, uh, uncomment this, fill in these uh, data here properly. Um, now, of course, you have to have the database already up and running. Um, and this inconvenience that you have to prepare the database first uh, also leads to this default that we still use H2 as a, you know, first testing experience. So there is no change on, on this front because uh, it's much easier to get familiar with, uh, with uh, Midpoint when you don't need any additional software, obviously. But the switch is easy. Either this one or use that uh, native config XML. Oh, sorry, 
one more thing. If you change native repository or like the repository type from this old repository, you can see that it was declared by this uh, service factory class. And the new one uses this type tag. The old one also understands type tag with different value, but the new one doesn't understand this tag at all. So use type native, uh, remove any remnants of the old configuration and you're using the new repository. It is super important then to switch also the audit, SQL audit. Either comment this section completely if you don't want to uh, try it first and just leave like audit to login or uh, uncomment this new scale audit service factory. We hope that this configuration of audits will change in the future uh, for also to be better readable and use words like native, but at this moment it's this factory class. This is config.xml example uh, I mentioned in that dun 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 here. It's uh, this one, config native. Uh, so it's pure config.xml for native repository. But you know, if you uncomment everything properly, it will look this way. Now, it somehow works, but we also, of course, want to make it work better. So we need to tune it a bit. There are some uh, sizing recommendations uh, available in our documentation for years, but it doesn't go over 100,000 users. We will update it, but, uh, but at this moment um, you can simply use what, you, what you've got already. You know, If you have database that big, use that big database for the new repository and you will be fine, because the new repository uh, should not uh, take more room than the old one, uh, having the same data. In. <clears throat> so uh, talking about sizing, it's uh, not only disk sizing, but it's also performance like sizing, you know, CPU, memory, I.O. Uh, again, if you have some hardware already and it works reasonably well, just keep that one. Because even if I gave you some recommendations, you know, it depends on many, many things, like uh, how you really use it, how often you hit it, uh, how often you use REST and other things. Uh, there is one thing, however, I want to mention, and that's the, uh, the that's a change of configuration of Postgres configuration because by default uh, configuration changes like for not very big uh, deployments and it will work even in, uh, on on big server and uh, but the question is how well the server resources will be used by Postgres then you know what maybe the memory will be used only for disk caches <clears throat> so it's always good to tweak the configuration. Uh, based on on your server size, I use this uh, calculator for that uh, because uh, you either have an expert that really knows what to do, or you start with some recommendations, right? And um, this is quite a nice thing because you uh, enter the parameters of your server and your deployment and what type of application you have, and uh, from all the types, you know, it can be like. Uh, OLAP, uh, warehouse, uh, web application, mixed type of application seems to be, uh, seems to fit midpoint the best. And uh, it will give you all this uh, configuration uh, setup that you add to your Postgres conf and um, then restart the database and it should use the resources better in the end. Uh, of course, you can read about these uh, on the Postgres documentation, which is very nice documentation. I recommend going there for any answers. But uh, this is a good start. You know. Definitely better than the default configuration. Uh, as I said, the information, the, the storage uh, should not be bigger for a new database. Um, or not, not should be big. I, I mean, <laughs> a new database should not take more than the old database with the same data. Uh, of course, you can have a bigger storage, that's not a problem. Um, so, you when, when you want to learn the storage uh, size, you really ask your Postgres, uh, Postgres your database admin, uh, how big the storage is, because it's not only about, I don't know, some of 
all the XML sizes. That's not the actual database size, right? There are uh, indexes and other things. So ask your database admin. <clears throat> and then there is uh, the question of audit tables, right? If you take audit tables away, uh, then uh, you find out that for the main part of the repository, you actually don't need uh, such a big disk, uh, although it doesn't mean that you want less CPU for, for the main portion of the repository. I guess not. There are, there, this is an example of a query in Postgres, of course. If you migrate from other database, uh, you have to find some equivalent or something similar. And this is uh, our testing database, uh, which, uh, as you can see, took 309 gigabytes for the main portion of the uh, repository. But in total, it took actually much more, 830 gigabytes, because most of it was taken by the audit. And this was audited uh, after hardly some initial, you know, some import and few tasks ran there. So even after a short uh, time, the audit takes most of the room. So you definitely think about separating it to other database. Uh, other view about the same, because here we have a total number of this table. Ah, def <laughs> by default, it's a name of the default partition. We'll talk about partitioning later. But, you know, any table. Uh, there's a total number uh, or total amount of uh, storage for the table. Then the table itself takes something. There is that toast, uh, which uh, stores the big chunk of data that doesn't fit into the main database, uh, into the main table for some reason. And then there are indexes. It's an interesting comparison between these two tables, user and shadow. Uh, when I look at it, I would say that the extension data or full objects, pro probably, yeah, full objects in this table are much bigger and they overflow into this table, while the shadows are probably much smaller and they are kept in the main part of the, uh, of the table. This is perhaps just some initial size. There may be no row at all. Uh, we have no ah, indexes are in this column. Let's split it to each type of objects. You know, so it's a table, it's a toast, and there are also some indexes here. And we can see that some of them are quite big. And even if they are not the top uh, performers or pe <laughs> top, uh, like they are not the biggest objects, there are perhaps more of them in the middle size. Let's look at it. Uh, it's another query that uh, asks for the total number of the total size of all the indexes. This is only for the for the main portion of the repository without audit. So compare it with the 309 gigabytes of the main portion, and you see that those indexes take 22 percent. Now, is it much or not? That's actually not a problem. Uh, the bigger problem with indexing is that they always come at a price, you know, because they have to be updated when the row is updated. Uh, just um, when, you, when you remove the row, just as there is a hole in the physical table and it needs to be vacuumed eventually, it's a technical term from Postgres world, uh, the index has to be vacuumed as well, because otherwise it physically still takes the room of uh, removed data. And uh, you may also know that uh, update is actually a delete and insert. So anytime you execute update on the database, on the Postgres database, it's not in place. It actually forgets the old row and creates a new one. So it also needs to be vacuumed. So most important columns, uh, you know, the columns that store those exploded data from the full object so we can search by these, they have B tree indexes on them, or other suitable indexes, because B tree are not good for substrings, for instance. So if you expect substring queries, then there are other uh, other indexes. But B tree is typical and for most cases fine. But not all columns have indexes. Maybe it seems strange, but as I said, it's always at some price, uh, and the storage is 
not the biggest price there. Imagine that you use the column only for some additional condition. So it will the database will first use uh, the indexed column and then perhaps just filter the results for the for the other condition. You don't need index for the other condition. Uh, even if there was no index usable, it's still searchable. Although in this case, it, the price is on the query side, of course, because it requires a full table scan, which in many cases can be fine still. You know, of course, it's probably not fine for users or shadows. And in that case, if you find out that you have some problem with some specific queries, you should identify these slow queries and perhaps add index that is relevant for you. It doesn't have to be relevant for other uh, deployments. Uh, I don't want to claim that uh, we put all the indexes there. Um, you know, it's always uh, work uh, in progress. But all database, for instance, had some indexes on Boolean columns, which are more waste of space than really useful. So we try to evolve from there. But as I said, it's not strictly wrong when you don't have every single column indexed. How can you find slow queries? Well, that's an, this is also in, in the documentation page, so we can find it there. Um, you can find it by either total amount of time taken, which uh, may not be relevant for queries run only here and there, average time, maximum time, and uh, what you need is this bgstat statements, which is an extension. Uh, it requires change in the PostgreSQL conf and, of course, restart. So I recommend to install it in advance. Uh, reportedly, the overhead of this library is very low. It's like percent or two. And if you have other performance problem, then it's well worth the cost, of course. So this, this may be a very nice uh, extension for identifying the slow queries. A uh, specific topic is this extension indexing. Extensions uh, are not stored in tables anymore. They are stored in the JSONB columns. And this JSONB column, uh, ext, or attributes column, which is for shadows. Oh, you know, shadow has also extensions, of course, but uh, they are uh, indexed by default with so-called gin index, which is inverse general index. And um, this is fine for EQ filter. So for like containment, if, for questions like, does this key contain this value? It's fine for this. It works very efficiently. But for other cases, like comparisons and substr substrings, you need to be you, you need to create your custom index so how do you do it uh, you actually point to the specific id under that extension json b uh, either this way when it's a non-string property or this way if it's a string property or a property represented by string like a date uh, you consult a catalog of extension items for this id and uh, then you decide for uh, for the right uh, index type because B tree is good for comparisons and for instance if you want substrings and like like operations uh, trigram is a good index example for trigram index for instance here's a query uh, it's a string ignore case query uh, for this extension slash string extension attribute string this value and it's encoded at, at the end so this has to be at the like ends with this value and ignoring ignoring the uh, casing so how does this translate to a query actually it's pretty natural so we're asking for this extension uh, item 195 if you remember uh, like that json b string oh, well it will simply pull this key of a value under this key 195 uh, and returns it as a string and because we know that it's a string and i like operation is ignores ignore case like right this is the value so it's bound to the end 
good index for this situation is uh, this one. So it's a gin index with this option, trigram options. And how do you get to this, to this number 195? You simply query this ext item table, which is a catalog of extension items in the database uh, for for the item name string. You know, I'm ignoring this uh, namespace part. So I'm just going for this. There is uh, this uh, new kit on the block called Cardinality, uh, because in the previous uh, repository, we didn't care about cardinality of uh, extension item. But uh, this actually matters for uh, for the new storage options. And in JSONB, I, I need to know whether uh, we put this uh, value uh, directly as a, uh, where is that? Sorry about this. Ah, here. Whether we put it directly, like this Michel, it's a single value, or whether we put it into array, like this Farrell. Even when it's a single value, but we know that the 16 is multi-value item, extension item, and it need to put it into array. And when the query is uh, constructed, it actually knows how to search for one and the other. It's it's not interchangeable. So <clears throat> yes, so this, this cardinality is important, and uh, it also caused some <laughs> problems recently, but uh, we've got it fixed hopefully. Experiment, yeah, query, yeah. Um, because playing with queries is very popular, right? We have this query uh, playground in our application, which you find just above that all about uh, menu item, all the way down and in the main menu in the application. And new native repository also supports it, this query playground, although it, mm, some labeling is perhaps not perfect yet. So you just put that midpoint query here. It works just like before. You don't have to switch anything here. You know, it, it knows what repository it works with. And what is shown here is then SQL. And here are the actual parameters. There is also this execute button, which uh, I guess should be disabled and will be very soon. If you press it now, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't work, you know, so you can't execute SQL. That would be a big security hole or two. So it's not possible. Uh, so you can only uh, execute this query and it will tell you how it looks. You can also translate it. Uh, there's other button, other button just, that just translates it and doesn't execute it. If you're just curious and you don't want to actually run it. Uh, some tips about API. So use Query play, uh, Playground. Uh, it will. It can tell you a lot about the, the resulting query. You should always prefer concrete types. Uh, so if you uh, want to query users, query for users, not for focus. And I don't know. You know, perhaps you will find the right user even when you query focus for a specific name. But that's not how you should do it because the focus query is um, actually executing like a union behind the scene for other focused subtypes. So always prefer the best, uh, the lowest possible type, you know, the most concrete type you can use. Most cases, well, most queries actually do so. This is not a problem only for the new repository. Uh, actually, old repository uh, didn't do unions, but it did like tons of joins instead. So it's questionable which was better. Uh, Generic queries are always less efficient, you know. <clears throat> so uh, another point is you should always limit the result count, uh, especially for experiments on large databases. You perhaps don't care about all the results. If, if you accidentally specify some very broad condition, native repository uses implicit limit of 10,000 if nothing is provided for sanity. Uh, you can override it in max size, but if you do so, you probably want to use the iterative search mechanism. So you should not want so many queries at once. Iterative search is also used by uh, various reports and you know anything that should run efficiently, um, possibly on the background, uses iterative search in midpoint. 
the schema upgrade, I mean SQL schema upgrade. Uh, that's the difference between the old script and the new scripts. In old scripts, you had to you had to identify uh, which portions of the script are relevant for you. Uh, well, of course, if you're not a developer, if you're just using one version, then you simply run the whole script, which says upgrade from that version to another version. Um, new repository is different. It uh, uses um, it wraps the changes uh, into calls of these. Uh, procedures apply change or apply audit change for audit schema and those changes are numbered and uh, it doesn't apply the same change uh, more times so you can simply run the script anytime you can rerun it and it is safe it it will not apply the changes again <clears throat> so it's a nice thing nice thing and we'll probably keep like a longer tail of changes in this script and uh, it can be a single script for upgrade from LTS and also from the last feature version. Now, the schema version is actually not semantic anymore. It's just a sequential number. Uh, so if, if this bothers you, you should check the upgrade script because there are comments like which change appeared for what version. Like these are under this comment are changes for version 441, for instance. Uh, there is no automatic DB upgrade or check for the native repository inside the application. So this is a kind of step back from the previous version. Perhaps you will have some check. Uh, it can be useful, but uh, it's not there at this moment. Uh, but the procedure is really simple. Just run the upgrade script. You can even run the upgrade script right after you initialize the database, but it doesn't have any meaning because uh, the upgrade script always gets to the uh, database to the state uh, what the initial script is you know the initial script is always the up-to-date state there's also a good reason you should not use them from some source you should use them from from uh, the distribution you you download but that's how it worked always right Migration to native uh, repository. Okay, so you have to first migrate to the 4.4 version using your original repository. So this is a traditional upgrade path. And after that, uh, you, you, sh you should use the last possible version. So it's possible to upgrade from 4.04, which is you know version that also states various uh, schema changes, or the last feature version. And uh, then it should be like use ninja and so on and so on and actually more details are in the next webinar although if there are some questions about it i will <laughs> try to answer them because i know that the migration uh, between uh, old repository and new one is not completely smoothed out yet um, very important thing is that audit migration can be uh, done in another step when the midpoint is already running so that this is not a reason for down uh, downtime. But the main portion of the repository has to be uh, migrated with the downtime. That's there's no question about it. Uh, break in repository changes. So new repository does not support H2. Um, you need to install some database to try it, you know. So if you want to just experiment with midpoint, you probably just start it with H2, but uh, it's not possible to easily, uh, very quickly experiment with midpoint and new repository. Uh, we'll think about strategy in this topic. We've got two years from to the next LTS to, to do something about it. Uh, very important change, OID must be in UID format. This actually breaks uh, a lot of things, um, like you have to fix those UIDs before the import or during the import, like migration, I mean, and uh, it can also affect the audit migration. So uh, it will be more addressed in the in the future webinar. So I want to talk in length here, but yeah, this is we always uh, like um, try to emphasize that you should use UID 
but uh, we also learned recently that sometimes people don't even understand what the UI, what we meant by that, you know, that it was just a format of those dashes. No, it also means that only hexadecimal numbers are used there. So we didn't realize that this is a question. Uh, there is a thing in our query API called group by filter, but it's probably meaningless and it will be gone. So I don't know whether anyone has problem with problem with this. Uh, audit dashboards uh, do not support SQL or HQL queries anymore. They now work with Query API. This is definitely changed for the better because now we use that Query API uh, more and more also for various, like audit is for instance internally container. <clears throat> and that's it, you know, everything else should be um, reported by Ninja. Uh, so, so much for upgrade. And now let's talk about audit for a while. Audit is uh, newly designed only for inserts. There are no updates. Previously, uh, there was this uh, re-index operation on the audit API, but it doesn't work for a couple of feature versions already because the semantics was unclear. We understand what it should have done, but in the end, we decided that uh, it was more trouble than, than, than worth it. So it should be insert only table which, because it's much more efficient. No vacuum is needed on insert only table. Of course, if you use cleanup, uh, cleanup task, uh, then the default implementation of cleanup table or different configuration, default configuration uses, I don't know how many days uh, and then deletes the rows from this table. And then, of course, you need to vacuum it. But um, delete is okay. No update is very bad. Uh, delete still requires vacuuming, but update is would be very bad. So uh, it is by design insert only. Optionally delete because it is, after all, an audit trail. You know, with one benefit, it's searchable. Uh, there are marginally fewer tables than in the original version because some of the data are like changed item paths and resource IDs are inlined in this main table, but the main culprits are still here, like uh, separate delta and ref tables. It stores audit even records, which are containers since 4.2 searchable. And it's similar, as I said, there's a slight change in the prefix. Although it was not uh, difficult to spot the change, uh, spot the tables because they have this odd in there, but that's a slight change in the prefix. Um, there is no dependency uh, from these tables to the main portion of the repository. You know, if you have separate database, then it also has this global metadata for uh, versioning. And uh, for instance, channel is not ID anymore, it's text. It's like the original value is put there. So it doesn't reference that MURI table. It, that would be a big complication. So it is completely independent from the main portion of the repository. All tables are partitionable by timestamp. That's why the timestamp originally only on this table are is now present on this and this table as well. Because it's a partitioning key and it must be presented, uh, it must be present on all tables which are partitioned by that key. And this is also, there's also this convenience uh, uh, improvement that uh, when you delete this row, it also deletes these rows automatically. So it cascades nicely. If you want to uh, configure a separate audit, then this is what the audit uh, configuration looks like in config XML. And then you add these things. The moment you add JDBC URL, midpoint says, oh, yes, I will create new connection pool for audit. And then you can point it to a uh, different database, use different user or even to diff different server, which is perhaps the best. Optionally, you can change the application name, which is the one that shows in the connection list, but that's just a demonstration. You can tweak the, the connection pool if you want. Partitioning. So as I said, all the, th all the tables are partitionable and they are partitioned exactly the same way by timestamp. And they should be partitioned by the same ranges, you know, 
always if you have some range of timestamps for a partition all these tables should be partitioned the same way uh, by default you don't have to do anything and then it uses the default partition so it's like no partition at all and this is fine for small uh, small deployments you know it's probably not worth the problems but if you want to these partitions and we'll talk about why you want them uh, then you can create monthly partitions. It can go to the future. You can go to the um, to the past uh, because for migration you need to. And uh, there is um, no automatic tool for that now, but we provide this procedure for that. It's safe to run it multiple times, so it doesn't create partitions that already exist. And so if you do this eventually, just don't forget to run it in the next 10 years you know uh, otherwise it will start writing to the to the to this default partition and it's difficult to migrate between partitions then that's uh, you, do, you don't want that definitely stick to the partitions if you chose to if you if you started to use partitions but partitions are not necessarily performance solution you know it's a uh, it can help with uh, query performance too if uh, you use this timestamp in the query then of course it can search only those partitions that are in the range of the timestamps you you used uh, so if you go like uh, between these two timestamps that's a good thing to add to the query without it it actually has to go through all the partitions anyway so it's like union of many smaller tables uh, which is still reasonably good for up to even hundreds of partitions. Thousands is probably too much, but th that's why we chose month partitions, monthly part partitions, because um, you may get to hundreds, but not to thousands, and it's still s reasonably small that you can uh, use uh, like quarterly uh, uh, cleanup strategy or monthly, or well, not weekly, of course. But it is possible, you know. To, to use anything like yearly so monthly is good compromise good strat good default strategy if you want you can adapt the, mm, the, the that procedure and change it to something else that's up to you uh, you probably want to remove audit records from cleanup policy configuration and system configuration because if you use partitions then you want to you know use the strength of partitions which is <clears throat> very fast uh, like retirement of, of those data you can easily drop it or detach it if you detach the partition it actually the table is still there and you can then move it it's just it's just not part of that uh, m audit table like logically anymore uh, using partitions this way which means that you only use partitioning mechanisms to uh, retire the data it means that you will never execute deletes you know when you disable this cleanup policy on audit and that means that no vacuum is needed on, on those uh, on, on those partitions on, on the m audit table that's a great thing uh, so minor drawback i believe it's minor but uh, i understand that yeah anything is not automatic it's it's always a drawback currently the partition management is manual only including cleanup um, this is all up to your database administrators on the other hand if you have such problems it probably was the problem already so this should be better uh, there are some uh, partitioning auto partitioning solutions but they are not part of the core uh, postgres postgres uh, distribution so like Bartman or this we, we leave this to to others <clears throat> uh, then let's uh, look at audit uh, mig migration example uh, there was an example with 1 million audit events migrated from generic Postgres to native Postgres uh, Ninja uh, supports this audit migration in midpoint 441 it didn't make it to 4.4 you if you if you don't need to fix some OIDs then I recommend you to to zip those files using the minus Z switch 
and you can run multiple ninjas in parallel for export with repo id filter uh, there are examples of this in on this link there are even examples how you can uh, generate all these commands using uh, bash script and psql uh, which will create even you know like intervals of repo id based on the actual repo id numbers in the database like uh, like percentiles and uh, you can say how many parallel things you want and so on and so on and you will just you know print all the commands for you <clears throat> so that's the easy part and then on the input uh, or import uh, side you can run ninja with multiple threads so that speeds it up too uh, in the end uh, i was able to uh, easily get 1000 entries from the database and import per second and import 400 per second but this can be done during the full load of midpoint already you know so of course it can be slowed down then but uh, the good thing is that uh, you don't have to stop midpoint for this original size of that audit was five gigabyte uh, with zip deltas so you couldn't read them in the database uh, and new size was uh, less than four gigabytes and the data uh, and the deltas were actually plainly visible because they were that uh, JSON text, you know, this JSON serialization. So, to wrap it up, there is this new native PostgreSQL repository. Uh, we believe it's better. We try to use all the knowledge from the old repository. And um, if some repository is improved, then it's this new one. Uh, we'll probably just fix the most critical things in the old repository and uh, retire it as soon as possible. Uh, you should consider using this new repository. Now, obviously, it's quite fresh, so you know it's not without risks. You should definitely try it on, on the test environment first, but that's pretty obvious for everybody, I guess. Um, there is this new SQL audit, which is related to the repository. You can't use um, old audit, SQL audit with uh, new repository. It's not possible. Uh, it can be partitioned. Think twice whether you need it. And if so, then I guess it will work for you, especially when you want to remove some old data. Uh, there are many changes in the documentation related to repository and uh, query API. It's much more up to date now, so it's worth reading. There are some links to these resources related to the topics we've covered today. We'll probably get to this. Yeah, this presentation will be downloadable. Uh, big thanks to European Union and the NGI Trust grant that uh, helped us with mid-scale mid project uh, and uh, under the umbrella of this project we actually created this new repository uh, to scale better and to be better prepared for the future so big thanks to European Union and there are more webinars coming I guess uh, many of you will be interested in the next one related to upgrade because it's very closely related topic uh, but also uh, tasks are very important of course and then GUI and finally native reports uh, on weekly basis nearly yes weekly basis so you're all welcome to these webinars and that's all from me and um, thank you for your attention I'm ready for your questions